Well, good evening. Welcome to the Sunday evening service. It's a joy to be back with you again tonight. Trust you've had a special day. Trust the service this morning was a blessing to your heart. And uh, trust that tonight will be as well. I'll continue our series on Keys to a Calm Heart from John chapter 14. So uh, get your Bibles ready. We'll go there just in a couple of moments. Right now, let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless here today. Father, thank you again for your goodness. Thank you for the joy of being uh, with our people through this avenue. And ask you, Lord, to bless the teaching of your word tonight. May it encourage our hearts. May it bless our souls. May it teach us things that will carry us through uh, the difficult times that we are continuing to face as a city, as a state, as a nation, as a world. I pray, Lord, that you would use your word uh, to teach us tonight and to help us along in our spiritual journey. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good evening, Grace. Thank you for joining back uh, with us this evening. And uh, like Pastor Hunter said, I hope you did have a good afternoon and uh, a restful afternoon. Um, I want to encourage you, hey, let's pray for one another. Hope you're joining in on Wednesday nights, and I hope you have a pen and paper ready on Wednesday nights to pray over these prayer requests. We're still praying for Zach and Alex that the, uh, the interview they had the other day, they felt it went well. But uh, they're still, they still have not heard, and so we're praying that uh, the Lord would give those, um, allow them to adopt those children. I think it's God's will. And again, I can't give the details over the Internet, but um, continue to pray for them. Pray for one for another. I want to encourage you, like I've been saying, contact somebody. Uh, at least one a day, try to do that. Hey, make a contact, make a phone call, write a note, write a letter, an old-fashioned letter. There's power in the written word, and uh, write a letter. Send a te- uh, If you got to, send an email, send a text. That's the easiest way to do it. But uh, take the time and to encourage one another. I want to propose something. I want you to think about something. i got to work out the details. And, um, and uh, the, the, we're... It's freezing. This it was freezing this morning when we were recording this. But uh, the weather looks like there's nicer, warmer days. And uh, if the shutdown or the stay-at-home order um, is is held in place, or 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 just, I would like to do some something what I wouldn't call Christian caroling, not Christmas caroling, Christian caroling, and to some of our shut-ins and some of our folks that can't get out to not go in their house, but outside their house. Um, I've already talked to Larry about getting his guitar and uh, singing together and to let and go and to be uh, um, and to stand out. The high. We drive separately and um, to a couple of our folks and maybe spend a couple hours doing that. Maybe one Sunday afternoon. Um, I think it's supposed to rain next Sunday. But uh, if we got a warm and dry Sunday afternoon, maybe we'll come out and be able to uh, and to, to be a blessing. I'd love to do something like that. Let's pray. Maybe the Lord open that up. Now, Pastor Hunter is going to come, bring the message tonight. Looking forward to listening, hearing it myself, and be helped by it. So get your Bibles ready. John chapter 14, as Pastor comes and brings the message tonight. Pastor Hunter? Well, again, we're glad that you're here with us tonight. We are going to look at John chapter 14. We've been studying keys to a calm heart. This is a wonderful chapter. And our Lord gave some marvelous teaching to the disciples and as well as to us. Uh, through His Word that teaches us the importance and the basic principles of how to develop a calmness in our spirit. Uh, He began the entire chapter with this very well-known phrase, let not your heart be troubled. God's desire for us is that we know His peace, that we enjoy His peace, that we experience His peace, even in the midst of difficult and trying days. Uh, Remember the episode where Jesus was in the back part of a ship with his disciples on the Sea of Galilee, and the storm came, and the boat was tossed, and uh, the storm turned the ship around, and water was filling in, and the disciples became fearful. They woke the Lord who was asleep and said, Master, don't you care that we're perishing? And Jesus arose, and he rebuked the wind. He said, Peace be still, and the storm calmed. Even in the midst of that storm in the Sea of Galilee and the lives of the disciples at danger in that particular moment, Jesus still brought peace to the situation. And that's what God wants us to have. He wants us to enjoy peace in the midst of the storm. And we're looking at that theme here in John chapter 14. We've already noticed three 
of the factors of developing and having and enjoying a calmness of our spirit. In verses 1 through 6, we saw the assurance of heaven. What a thrill it is to know that heaven is real and that heaven can be ours. And when we have the assurance of heaven settled in our hearts, that certainly brings a calmness to our spirit. We don't have to wrestle with our eternal destiny. We don't have to wonder where we will spend eternity. Uh, We know that heaven will be our home. That can bring calmness to our spirit. And then the second key that we looked was in verses 7 through 12, and that is learning to know that God is our gracious Heavenly Father. He cares. He's there for you and me. Just like a father pitieth his child, God pitieth us, and God loves us, and God cares for us, and God desires to meet our needs. We can have a calmness of spirit when we realize that God is in charge, that He is in control, and He loves us with an everlasting love. And then the third key that we noticed last Sunday night is in verses 13, 14, and 15, and it's the key to prayer. When we learn how to pray and that God has promised to answer our prayer and that we can bring all of our requests, all of our needs, all of our burdens before the throne of God, He will hear, He will answer according to His will. That too can bring a calmness to our spirit because we're learning to turn the burdens over to Him. We're learning to follow the the, the words of the old song, leave it there. And as we learn to take our burdens to Christ, leave them at His throne, trusting Him for the proper answer, trusting Him for the right uh, uh, measures to take place in our lives, it will bring a peace and a calmness to each of our hearts. Now tonight, we're going to look at the fourth key to a calm heart. We're looking tonight at verses 16 through 26, and it's this, that is, calmness will come when we learn to enjoy a Spirit-filled life. It's understanding that the Holy Spirit of God plays an intricate part in our hearts and in our daily walk with God. Let me pick up our, our Scripture reading tonight at verse number 16. It says this, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also." At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Let's skip down to the end here a little bit, down to verse 26. Jesus says this, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The Spirit-filled life. And that's what this passage of Scripture is talking about. When we are speaking about a Spirit-filled life, we are talking about a life that is yielded under the control of the Holy Spirit of God that lives within each of God's children. Uh, Here in this passage now, there there are three things I want to draw to your attention about the Spirit-filled life. Let's talk for a moment about the promise of the Spirit-filled life, the promise of it. Uh, Jesus gives us the, uh, the promise of it right here in this particular passage of Scripture. Verse 16, he said this, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Here is the promise of the Holy Spirit of God. He uses the word comforter. The word comforter is the, the Greek word paraclete, and it simply means one who comes along beside of. It's a promise that Jesus is going to send someone to walk along with us. And then he defines that person in verse number 26 when he says, the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. He is the Holy Spirit of God. He is the comforter of God. He is the one who comes to to walk along with us, to help us through our daily journey, to give us the strength and power that we need. We'll talk more about that here in just a few minutes. But here is the promise of the Holy Spirit of God. It is vitally important that you and I as Christians understand that when we trusted Christ as our personal Savior, then we ask Jesus to come into our heart. When we said yes to the Savior, the Holy Spirit of God immediately came to take up permanent residency within the life and heart of our person. He lives within us. 
In fact, Jesus said in verse, uh, uh, verse number 17, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye shall know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. You see, in the Old Testament economy, the, the Old Testament saints, the Old Testament believers, they were used to the Holy Spirit coming and going. The Holy Spirit would come and empower for certain situations. But Jesus is making a promise here. He is making a commitment here that when he departs, when he ascends back to heaven to be with the Father, the Holy Spirit of God will come. You see, we believe in a triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Much preaching uh, is about God the Father. There's much preaching about God the Son, but probably not enough preaching on God the Holy Spirit. And we need to understand that the Holy Spirit of God, that part of the triune Godhead, promised to come and be in us. Not come and depart, but come to take up permanency, residency in each of our lives when we trust Christ as our personal Savior. So here is the promise of the Holy Spirit. And then also we see in the passage the promise of His abiding presence. He said He will be with you. Aren't you glad that that somebody is with you from time to time to, to help you, encourage you? That someone's there to, to, to pray with you and help you along your journey, maybe to give you advice, maybe to uh, uh, put their arm around you and encourage you in some way. It's nice to have somebody with you. Well, with the Holy Spirit of God, we have somebody with us all the time. He is there. The promise of, is of His abiding presence. Jesus said, the Comforter will come. The Holy Spirit will come. And He has and He is here with us today. And not only do we have the promise of His abiding presence, but we have the promise of His indwelling. He said in the same verse, in verse 17, He shall be in you. What a thrill. No, the Holy Spirit of God lives with us, and He will never depart from us. Here is the wonderful promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit of God. And because we have the Spirit of God living within us, we can enjoy a Spirit-filled life. And when we're talking about the Spirit-filled life, we're again talking about a life that is under the control of the Spirit of God. That we are allowing the Holy Spirit of God to have His work in our lives. We're allowing Him to do His will in our lives. That we are submitting ourselves to that authority and learning to grow and develop through the work of the Holy Spirit in each and every one of us. Now, when we talk about the Spirit-filled life, there are two key factors to, to truly uh, having that and enjoying it and, and knowing the reality of it. Uh, the first factor is there needs to be an emptiness in our life, an emptiness. In other words, we need to empty ourselves of self. Uh, the problem with most of us is that we're too full of our self. I believe it was D.L. Moody who made the statement one time. He said, my greatest enemy is myself. And that's true for every single one of us. And it's because we are so full of our self. Uh, we have our own desires. We have our own way of doing things. We have our own thoughts. We have our own opinions. Uh, we have our own desire. Uh, we want to do what we want to do. Well, we need to empty ourselves of self. We need to come to a point where we realize that, that God is more important than us. Uh, we must understand the scripture that said, He must increase, I must decrease. We need to set ourselves out of the picture, really. There needs to be an emptiness of ourself. And then when we are empty of ourself, then there needs to be the filling of the Holy Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit can fill our lives. So there must be an emptiness, then there must be a yieldedness. Where we empty ourselves of ourself, but then fill ourselves with God, that we yield ourselves. To him and his word, that we give ourselves over to a thus saith the Lord, and do what God instructs us to do. We learn to, to trust God on a daily basis. We learn to apply his word to our hearts and our lives with various situations that we face in our lives. So there must be an emptiness of self. There must be the, then be a yieldedness of our heart, our lives, our bodies unto the Lord. So here is the promise of the Spirit-filled life. But the second thing that we find here in the passage is not only the promise of a Spirit-filled life, but we also find the purpose of it. 
The purpose behind this spirit-filled life. The word comforter reminds us of the ultimate purpose of, of the Spirit at work in our lives. He comes alongside of us. He's there to minister to us. He's there to encourage us. He comes alongside, which simply means he's there to nurture the believer. And this is described for us in several different ways in, in this particular passage as well as a couple others. For example, and here in verse 26... Jesus reminds us that the Holy Spirit of God will teach the believer. He teaches us. He teaches us the truth of of the Word of God. He is a teacher to the believer. What a promise this is. Uh, he, He said he will teach you all things. My wife is a teacher. She enjoys teaching. Uh, She enjoys teaching four year old children. I would not get a real kick out of that myself, I don't think. But my wife thoroughly enjoys it. In fact, one of the most uh, things that she enjoys the most in teaching four-year-old children is she enjoys teaching them to read. Because they're just at that stage of learning. They're just at that eager stage to to reach out and and, and be taught something. And, And she loves to teach the children how to read. She's a teacher to them. Well, the Holy Spirit of God is a teacher to us. He teaches the truths of God's Word. He teaches the importance of submitting to God. He teaches us the basic factors of the Scriptures and and how to apply them to our hearts and lives. That's one of the key purposes of the, the role of the Holy Spirit of God in each and every one of us. He teaches the believer. In fact, over in the Gospel of John, just a couple chapters over, in John chapter 16, in verse 13, uh, the Bible says this, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, here the Holy Spirit of God is called the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. A reminder that the Holy Spirit is the one who teaches us and guides us in the truth of God's Word. And then we learn the second thing is in also in verse 26 when he says this, He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. In other words, he is a reminder to the believer. Not only does he teach us the truth, he reminds us of the truth. Have you ever found yourself facing a certain burden? Uh, maybe just maybe just sitting at home and it's been a trying day. Maybe there's been something you've been struggling with. Maybe there's something that's been pressing against your mind. And all of a sudden you find a, a verse of Scripture coming to your mind. Maybe a chapter, maybe a couple verses that, that are apropos and, and uh, fit with the situation that you're facing. And, and, and you, you, you find that coming to your mind and it's comforting to your heart. Do you know who is doing that? Do you know who is at work in your life to help you to remember that verse? It's the Holy Spirit of God. He is doing His work. He lives within you. He's taught you. And now He's reminding you of those truths. What a blessed ministry in the work and the life of the Holy Spirit of God. He is a teacher. He is a reminder. Uh, Somebody used the phrase, He is our internal compass. He directs all of our steps. He guides everything in our lives. Not only that, but He also gives power for us to witness. Uh, That truth is explained to us very well in Acts chapter 1, where it says that the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. You know, we cannot witness for Christ without the power of the Holy Spirit of God. It just really is rather futile. Because it's the Holy Spirit of God that works in the lives of people to draw them to Christ. And we need the power of the Holy Spirit of God upon us to share the Word of God with people. It all fits together, but He gives us that power. He gives us that spiritual unction uh, so that we can share the message of Christ, share the good news of salvation with a lost and dying world. But then also, He convicts the believer. That's part of His purpose. That's what He does. I go back to John, excuse me, John chapter 16. Verse 7, and Jesus said this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter, that's the Holy Spirit, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. 
of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, of judgment because uh, the, the prince of this world is judged. The Word of God tells us that one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit and His coming is that He will convict our hearts. You know, when we do wrong, and we sin against God, and the power of the Holy Spirit works in our lives, it brings that conviction, that unsettledness, that guilt, that we know we have done wrong and the need to confess it, the need to get it right, the need to get our life clean and pure with God once again. That's the work of the Holy Spirit of God that does that in each and every one of us. So here is the purpose of the Spirit-filled life, that He might teach us, He might remind us, He might fill us with His power, and He might convict us of sin in our lives. There's a third thing that we find in the passage about the calmness of heart that comes through the Spirit-filled life, and that is this, that is the product of the Spirit-filled life. The product that that is developed in each of our hearts. Let me just share four quick things with you about these products that come when we learn to yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit of God. First off, there will be a boldness to speak the truth of God's Word. There will be a boldness to proclaim the message of Christ. There will be a boldness of, of, of the, the Word of God and directed into our hearts and, and, and into the lives of other people that we are seeking to minister to. You see that throughout the Scriptures, especially in the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, when the church is forming and the church is in its young infant stages and, and the Word of God is being given out in a fresh new way. And you see the disciples filled with the Holy Spirit of God and you see the boldness they have in sharing the message of Christ. Oh, may God give us that today. In spite of what we are facing with COVID-19, may God give us the unction to still share His Word with a needy world, people around us that need the message of Christ, and their hearts are open today because of what they're facing, because of the fears that are encompassing them. Hearts are tender, and we need to take advantage of that and do what we can to get the message of Christ to this lost and dying world. And God gives us the boldness to do just that. Then second, there also comes a sweet spirit in the life of a believer who is yielded to the Spirit of God. We find that over and over again. Uh, If you take time to read in the book of Acts chapter 7, and read the testimony of a man by the name of Stephen, who was preaching the truth of God's Word. And as a result, he was uh, leaped upon and was stoned and and was murdered for his his, uh, uh, message of Christ. But you see, in the midst of all he was suffering as he was dying, you will see the sweetest spirit a man could ever have in the midst of grave difficulty. And God gives us that kind of sweetness when we are going through the difficulty of life. Uh, Paul described it for us. In the book of Galatians, uh, chapter 5, it it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and uh, uh, that is uh, the things that come when we learn to be yielded uh, to the Spirit of God. Uh, It it says uh, this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. What fruits they are. And they all point to a sweetness of spirit when we are yielded to the Holy Spirit of God. And then not only that, but then there is also a willingness to suffer, a willingness to go through the difficulties of life. We don't fight against it. We don't argue about it. We realize that the burdens will come. We understand the difficulties of life will face us. It's just a matter of life. But when they are there... If we're Spirit-filled and we're allowing the Spirit of God to control us as we yield to Him, then we will learn to suffer with a willingness of heart. We won't argue against it. We won't uh, fight against it. Uh, We may not enjoy it. We may not like it. But God gives us a peace, a settledness of heart, so that we can go through it without the complaining and the nagging and the difficulty that comes with all of that. And then may I give you one last quick thing that happens when we learn to yield our heart to the Lord and to the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And that is we'll have eyes that are fixed on the Savior. Eyes that are fixed on the Savior. Let me take you to Acts chapter 7 for just a moment. I mentioned that chapter a couple of minutes ago when we were talking about Stephen 
But I want you to see a, a wonderful truth uh, that's uh, unleashed for us here in uh, uh, Acts chapter 7, uh, where it talks about Stephen and uh, him uh, uh, being murdered and, and the death that he was enduring. Uh, in verse number 55, it says this, but he, speaking of Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, he was filled, he was yielded, he was going through a stoning, he was being put to death, he was being executed, but it reminds us that even in that moment, he was yielded to the Spirit of God, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. What does that remind us? It reminds us that even the most difficult of times, that if we will allow our hearts to be filled with the Spirit of God, we can lift our eyes and keep them fixed on Jesus. What happens so often is that we are, we are much like Peter was. On the day that they were again on a storm-tossed sea, and all of a sudden, in a distance, they saw Jesus walking on the water. And they were fearful, but yet, Jesus bid Peter to come unto him. And by faith, Peter stepped out of the boat and began to walk towards the Savior. But then all of a sudden, his eyes got to looking around at the storm. And when he got his eyes focused on the storm, he began to sink. And Jesus reached out and took him by the hand and lifted him back up on the water. And Peter got his eyes fixed on Jesus again, and he and Jesus together walked hand in hand back to the ship on the water. So often we're, we're, we're like Peter sinking down in, into the storms of life because we're looking at the storm. We're looking at the trouble. We're, we're fearful of the prospects. We're, we're unsure of the future. We're not sure what's going to take place and it's causing great heartache and devastation to our lives. But when we allow our hearts to be filled with the Spirit of God, when we yield ourselves to Him, it will allow us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus who will safely lead us through the storms of life and bring us safely to the port of call he has for us. The calmness of heart, not only does it come when we have the assurance of our salvation and that heaven then is our home, not only does it come when we recognize God as our gracious Heavenly Father, that he's there to care for us, love us, meet our needs, walk with us, help us in every situation, not only does it come from the place of prayer where we can bring our burdens to the Lord and leave them there, it also comes from the recognition that the Holy Spirit of God lives within us and that we should be yielded to Him under His control. And as we yield our heart to Him, we will know His peace. We will know His help. We will know His teaching, His reminders to guide us through in our journey of life. Father God in heaven, thank you for your help today. Thank you for the Holy Spirit of God that lives within each of your children. Lord, may we be submissive to him. May we listen to him as he teaches us and reminds us of your word. May we be filled with the Holy Spirit of God so that we might be used of God and enjoy all of the byproducts that come as a result of allowing him to control us. Bless us, we pray, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for watching the YouTube video today. If you've not subscribed, hit that subscribe button in the notification. That means every time we put one of these out, it automatically you'll get a notification that we've got a new video out. And uh, we're just humbled by uh, you taking the time. There's a lot of things on YouTube that you've taken the time to watch this video. Uh, we're learning. Uh, working and uh, getting this uh, all put together. Um, thank you for your time today. God bless you.